Good morning and welcome to day three of our second annual Emerging Scholars Symposium. This symposium is a partnership between the Rosen Roosevelt Truman and Eisenhower Libraries. Our theme for this year is Here is Your War, Military Press and Homefront Visions of War. Today, we are pleased to welcome Natalia Zalil Talk for our final presentation. Nat Natalia has a PhD in history and she is the head of the Department of Archival Studies of the Ukrainian Research Institute of Archival Affairs and Record Keeping in uh, Kiev, Ukraine. So welcome Dr. Zalil Talk and take it away. Hello to everyone. First of all, I want to thank the Eisenhower, Roosevelt, and Truman Presidential Libraries, Joy Murphy, and all the organizers of the Emerging Scholars Symposium for the invitation to be a speaker on this event. It is a big honor for me. Today, I am going to tell you about periodicals as a source of research on the women's service in the Soviet Armed Forces. It is known that during the Soviet-German War, the USSR recruited women into the military on an unprecedented scale and did not introduce any restrictions to their participation in direct combat. There are various statistics in academic circulation for the number of Soviet women in the armed forces during the war. The official Soviet statistics contain a figure of eight uh, 100,000 women in the ranks of the Soviet armed forces, and it is actively used by some modern Russian scholars. Instead, I trust more recent and objective data provided by Roger Markic and Evrodis Cardona. They estimate the total number of women in the Red Army at 1 million. The total number of the Soviet army was about 34 and half million people, and therefore the percentage of women was about 3%. The war experience of the Soviet female soldiers has repeatedly been the subject of historical research. However, I didn't find any separate studies that analyzed the importance of Soviet periodicals as a source for studying the experience of women during the service in the armed forces from 1941 to 1945. The dissertations on the issue usually contain just a brief description of this type of source. For example, Petrakova, without going into detail, characterizes the Soviet newspapers as distinguished by their uniqueness, but not informative enough. At the same time, given the sustained interest of researchers in studying the problem of women's military service in the USSR during the Soviet-German War, a deep analysis of this type of source and evaluation of its potential for the study on the issue is of particular interest. We need to understand the true nature of the Soviet need for women's participation in the Red Army from 1941 to 1945. The role of propaganda and the inconsistency of facts help us see more clearly what transpired during this period. This study is meant to contribute to this history. First of all, I want to describe the most characteristic features of the discourse concerning service women in the Soviet periodicals of wartime. While conducting this research, I used a collection of digitized Soviet newspapers from the digital portal Elektronikasovka. Next slide, please. You can see on your screen a screenshot from the Elektronikasovka website with the result of a search by keywords Vichernia Moskva for the dates between 1941 and 1945. Also, this website allows searching in the texts of newspapers by keywords, so one can find the necessary thematic materials faster and make some important points in the conclusions. In particular, I discovered that throughout the Soviet-German war, there was a tendency to use the word woman when covering the atrocities of the enemy in the Soviet lands, where the representatives of the so-called weaker sex performed the role of victims that were beaten, raped, tortured, shot, etc. Such materials significantly outnumber the articles that cover various activities of women during the war. Women were mentioned alongside the elderly and children as the most vulnerable and weak members of society. In the second place in terms of the numbers are materials on women's labor exploits. 
The newspapers emphasized that women have replaced men who went to the farm in factories, in agriculture, uh, in other positions in the rear, learned male trades, and in such a way they helped the front. It is noteworthy that in almost all materials devoted to the women's effort in the war, this topic is the leading one, even when the materials mention female soldiers too. Exceptions are articles about specific women at the front, for example, dedicated to Lyudmila Pavlichenko, Nina Anilova, and others. In the third place are materials on nurses and health education supervisors in the Red Army, as well as female partisans, because these occupations were considered most suitable for women. The nurses and health education supervisors uh, officially were not in combat positions. The partisans' role was connected much more with resistance from the local population to the Nazi troops. Among the partisans, there were usually people who, for one reason or another, were not suitable for service in the regular troops. Women as a category of society fits this role. Therefore, the partisans were more likely a symbol of resistance, a demonstration of the population's loyalty to the Soviet regime, and a means of rising the fighting spirit of the regular troops of the USSR. At the same time, there was a relatively small number of general materials devoted to the service women in the Soviet armed forces in combat positions. It is not worthy that even in the materials about female soldiers, their authors sometimes reminded us that women are closer in status to children than to men. For example, in the article Great People's Power, Tikhonov puts them in a row, writing that mass heroism of Leningrad represents the exploits not only, not only of men, but also women, youth, and school children. There are some specific trends in mentioning women soldiers in the Soviet newspapers from 1941 to 1943. During this period of time, there is a transition from the omission of women's presence in the armed forces two modest mentions of this fact. In the first months after the beginning of the Soviet-German war, the news about women who voluntarily went to the front was quite actively published in the Soviet newspapers. However, these were mostly women who sought to go to the front as nurses and health education supervisors. The majority of materials of 1941 on women's participation in the war highlighted their work in the rear, Almost every article on the issue focused on the fact that women replaced men who went to the front. At first, the Soviet authorities insisted that there was no need for women to become Red Army soldiers. At the same time, the government acknowledged that there was a large number of women who asked to be sent to the front for combat service. In the article from the Pravda newspaper, it is stated that the whole country knows that a Soviet woman will take a rifle and go to the front to beat the enemy. At the moment, in the army and the front, a woman is needed, first of all, as a nurse, as a health education supervisor, as a doctor. It is noteworthy that this article was published on the 4th of August 1941. A little more than two months later, on the 8th of October 1941, Joseph Stalin signed an order to create three women's air regiments. As one can see, the creation of these regiments was not a public affair. Moreover, the USSR, at least in the first years of the war, tried to dissociate itself from the fact that it launched the formation of purely female military units in its armed forces, because this could be considered as the consequence of the shortage of the, of the male population in the country. Information about such units periodically leaked to the press, and the USSR responded to it with outright lies. For example, in the material published on the 8th of July 1941 in the Vichernia Moscow newspaper, it is stated, Stefani Agency reported that the USSR's government ordered to form women's regiments. There are millions of women in the USSR who are ready to fight against the fascist hordes with weapons in their hands. But we were not going and are not going to organize women's regiments. We have three times as many men as in Germany, and everyone knows what they are fighting for, while in Germany, nine-tenths of the population do not know in the name of what the war against the Soviet Union began. 
Another message published on the 1st of August 1941 in the Vichernia Moscow newspaper stated that the reason for refusing to satisfy the woman's application to be sent to the front as a soldier was uh, that there is no need for female combatants because country's male reserves are countless. However, it quickly became clear that Soviet male human resources are not countless. The number of materials that mention women who fought with weapons in their hands increased after the beginning of the defense of Leningrad. In these materials, one could often find calls to women not only to intensify work in their year and join the ranks of health education supervisors and nurses, but also to join combat units. All women must become active fight, uh, fighters against fascism. If we want to enjoy maternal happiness, if we want to raise a free generation, a generation of people with the right to life and happiness, if we want wars not to devastate our lands, our homes, our children not be orphans and disadvantaged vagrants, if we want all this, our place is in the ranks. Women, fascism is our worst enemy. These words were written by the author of the article Women from the whole world are against fascism, published on the 9th of September 1941 in the Pravda newspaper. Mentions of the large-scale part participation of women in the war with weapons in their hands also became more frequent during the defense of Kiev. The article from the Pravda newspaper, published on the 15th of September 1941, said the girls of Kyiv, together with their parents and brothers, are selflessly fighting the enemy. Many female Komsomol members have already become famous on the battlefield. 18 years old Tanya Didenko, machine gunner Olga Yakimova, nurse Nezamykina and partisan Katya Abramova. They are everywhere, these brave girls of our city. The inhabitants of Kyiv, on the front and in the rear, show their courage and heroism. Along with such rhetoric, during this period continued to be more common a discourse according to which women should help the soldiers, but not be soldiers. For example, in the article by Lina Stern published in the Vichernia Moscow newspaper on the 24th of September 1941, it is stated that we women must help our soldiers by all means available to us at the front and in the rear, replacing those who go to the front in factories, laboratories, schools, and in the fields. Also popular in the first year of the Soviet-German war were various appeals to women in the USSR or even around the world. Prominent factory workers, writers, artists, deputies, and others signed one of such appeals in 1941. In its text, Soviet women folk represented mothers, wives, and sisters who sent their men to the front. According to the appeal, women by themselves must work permanently in the rear to support the front. In the appeal to women around the world, published on the 8th of September 1941 in the Vichernia Moscow newspaper, emphasis was placed on the auxiliary role of women in the war, side by side with the Red Army, which took the primary effort in the fight against Hitler's hordes, the Soviet woman stands still in her position. The more the enemy is furious, the stronger her heart and will to win. At the forefront, she assists the wounded, she extinguishes fires caused by Nazi pilots, she stands at the factory and makes weapons and shells. She fights in guerrilla units with her husband and son. As one can see, there is no mention in the text of women in combat positions in the regular army. The rhetoric used to highlight the participation and contribution of women in the war did not reflect the declaration by the Soviet government of equal status for men and women in society. Newspapers often claimed that women had done something for the Red Army fighters, soldiers, servicemen. These statements, in addition to the main aim to give information about what was done, also contained a hidden message expressed in the opposition between the terms woman and fighter, soldier, serviceman, etc., and omitting the presence of women in the armed forces. The rhetoric on service women in the Soviet army in the newspapers of 1942 differs from the discourse of 1941. Also, they continued to cover most women's experiences from the perspective of victims 
as well as describe their contribution to the country's defense in the rear, partisan units, and in the medical service at the front. Along with this, the mention of the female soldiers begin to appear more often. Nevertheless, the public discourse on the issue remained highly controversial. Very often in the articles with the common titles as female patriots, glorious female patriots, etc., the labor achievements of women or their nursing activities were highlighted, but not large-scale involvement in the military service. Thus, in the article Soviet Higher, uh, Higher School in the Patriotic War, published in the Pravda newspaper on the 18th of January 1942, the role of women is presented with an emphasis on replacing men in their year, but without mentioning their presence in the fronts. A similar picture is presented in the material The Exploits of the Soviet Women in the Izvestia Sovetov Deputata Trudyashiksia SSR newspaper, published on 19th February 1942. The number of materials devoted to various forms of participation of Soviet women in the war since 1942 grew rapidly before the 8th of March. This trend continued until the end of the Soviet-German war. The newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda on the 8th of March 1942 published the article Soviet Girl on the front page. It stated that the Soviet women were building the Soviet state on an equal footing with men, and now they are defending it together as well. Then it described women's participation in partisan units, in the construction of fortifications, their service as nurses, healthcare instructors, doctors, and their work in the factories. At the end of the article, it is stated that Soviet girls and women work very well in the rear and they will not be ashamed to look into the eyes of the heroes of the war, their men. At the same time, the fact that uh, of women's uh, service in the regular army is not even mentioned. There was a place for female soldiers in some uh, other materials, including visual ones. Thus, the newspaper Vichernia Moskva on the 8th of March 1942 published a photograph of the four smiling girls in uniform. Next slide, please. The caption of the photo was as follows. Thousands of girls volunteered for the Red Army. In the photo, there are the excellent fighters of the Ants Signal Battalion, where the commander is Comrade Schwedz. Mayenkova, Petrova, Trivogina, and Shkarina. The information of the, on the anti-Nazi rally of the female workers of Trivorka, published on the 8th of May 1942, stated that the best daughters of the Soviet people went to the front and became brave spies, machine gunners, fearless partisans. The article published on the 29th of December 1942 in the newspaper Vichernia Moskva stated that Ukrainian women were bravely fighting against the Germans as doctors, nurses, spies, snipers, and bombers. The article from the Pravda newspaper on 23rd of March 1942 mentioned female pilots at the front. In addition, sometimes in the press one could come across isolated reports about the training of female snipers. For example, the material The Girls Snipers published on 22nd of October 1942 in the newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda stated that unit of female snipers of Seobuch, which can be translated as general, general compulsory training of the railway district of Voroshilov, achieved considerable success. The women showed good results in shooting and trained hard in any weather. In general, in 1942, the Soviet periodicals, along with attempts to omit the presence of women in the ranks of the armed forces on the front line, almost openly began to call them to join the army. In particular, the article Soviet Girl Masters in Military Specialties, published on 25th of March 1942 in the newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda, presented the information about Soviet girls that fought at the front side by side with their husbands, brothers, and fathers. Along with examples of female partisans, the story of the anti-tank gun operator Lubovzinskaya was described. Lubovzinskaya wrote, If an enemy shall tore off my hand, I would fight with one hand. If I lose my legs, 
I would crawl to the beast herd and destroy it with a grenade. If my eyes are torn out, I would see the enemy with the eyes of my heart and I wouldn't miss. The article called on other young women to master military skills. Research shows that such appeals were caused by the extremely large losses of the Soviet armed forces and the lack of male resources. But the authorities made effort to keep this fact secret. In its text, they call for girls to become military pilots, machine gunners, air defense specialists, etc., was veiled by the strong desire of women to acquire such a profession. We can and must take care of the direct military training of women and girls. We send women in the army at the forefront in exceptional cases. We have enough men reserves for it. However, this doesn't mean that we should limit the opportunities for combat training of Soviet female patriots who sincerely want to take up arms. If a young Soviet female patriot is eager to master a machine gun, we must allow her to realize this dream. If a Soviet girl wants to become a sniper, we have no right to deny her to realize her dream. If a Soviet girl has mastered equestrian sports before the war and wants to master the cavalryman's weapon, we must help her to do this. It is worth noting that this and other articles which called on women to join the army and fight against the enemy in battle argued that this was necessary in order to try to finish the war in 1942. These texts argued that this were a feasible task if all people, including women, would try to ac accomplish it. Thus, they tried to impose on society the idea that the presence of women on the battlefield as soldiers was not the result of the defeat of the Red Army and the lack of human resources, but the ardent desire of the women themselves and, and an attempt to end the war as soon as possible. Even so, many women served in the same combat positions as men and were able to cope with their duties, they continued to be described in the periodicals as the weaker sex. Even in the materials devoted to their combat experience, their inferiority was emphasized. For example, the article Russians are fighting with exceptional skills and unsurpassed fiery rage said that even women and children are fighting against hordes of conquerors. The use of the word even in this context is a clear attempt to emphasize the fact that the struggle was joined by those categories of population who are considered the most vulnerable, and therefore those who cannot compete effectively with the stronger sex. Also, this statement causes concerns, because in a real fight, the one who is stronger physically does not always win. In general, the Soviet authorities did not cover the scale of the presence of women in the armed forces in combat positions. However, it allowed the publications of numerous materials devoted to specific heroic features. Next slide, please. One of them was a sniper, Lyudmila Pavlichenko. Materials about her began to appear in the periodicals more and more often from the summer of 1942. Information about the outstanding female combatant was published in general articles about the snipers of the USSR, as well as in those dedicated to her personally. The portrait of Lyudmila Pavlichenko and a note about her were published on the 5th of September 1942 in the column Use in War and Battle of the newspaper Vichernia Moskva. The text reported that this female sniper was a student of the Faculty of History. During her military activities, she won the Order of Lenin, managed to take part in the battles for Odessa and Sevastopol, and killed 309 enemy soldiers. Uh, another public Soviet heroine who fought with weapons in her hands was the machine gunner Nina Anilova. Next slide, please. On the right hand, you can see Nina Anilova's portrait from the Pravda newspaper published on the 20th of March, 1942. In 1943, there was a clear tendency to increase the number of mentions of female fighters in the armed forces of the USSR. Although, 
at the All Union Rally of the Mothers and Wives of Soldiers in 1943, the report on which was published in the Pravda newspaper on 14th of April 1943, the representation of mothers of service women was much higher than in the previous year. In addition, the speakers placed significant emphasis on the fact that many women are soldiers of the regular army. In particular, the mothers of the dead sniper Natalia Kapshova and pilot Marina Raskova were present at the event. In her speech, the latter stressed that she receives letters from women who are at the front and in the rear every day. For example, the female representatives of Bashkortostan promised that they would continue the work of her famous daughter. The article Heroic Daughters of the Soviet People, published in the Izvestia Soviet of Deputatov Trudyashik SSSR newspaper on the 13th of January 1943, emphasizes that uh, the Soviet woman proved to be truly great and powerful in the war. The Russian woman, who was described enthusiastically on the best pages of our literature, has risen to her full height, full of love and anger, energy and inexhaustible mental strength. Detailing the contribution of women to the country's effort in the war, the authors emphasize, first of all, their work in the rear on the male positions in production, agriculture and supply. However, their presence in the army is not forgotten either by noting that the woman found her place in the ranks of our army, in its medicine units, in partisan units, and on the battlefield, where, like Lyudmila Pavlichenko, smashes the enemy with the fire of hate. However, no information on the scale of this phenomenon is provided. A short note about Soviet snipers published on the 28th of May 1943 mentions that among them were not only men, but also women. Abduz Valeyeva and Shalashnova, girls snipers who voluntarily went to the front, also shoot well. In two days, both killed two Nazis. The materials dedicated to female machine gunners and tank drivers followed those about the female snipers. For example, some notes published in 1943 were dedicated to machine gunner and spy Galina Markova and machine gunner Marina Grudistova. The article The Tank Bayevaya Padruga is Ready for Combat, published on 27th of August 1943, told about the example of Maria Oktyabrskaya, who lost her husband at the front and paid for the construction of the tank on her own cost, called it Bayevaya Padruga, which can be translated in English as Fighting Girlfriend, and decided to become its mechanic driver. At the time of publication, the woman mastered the tank driving skills and was ready to go to the front. Maria Oktyabrskaya claimed, When I get behind the wheel of a tank, I will take revenge on all women and children tortured by Hitler's sacks. It will be the happiest day of my life. Descriptions on the exploits of the Soviet service women often focused on the how many enemies they killed. Often these figures were exaggerated and differed from article to article. For example, the most widespread information is that the machine gunner Nina Anilova killed more than 500 soldiers. However, Levus Pensky, now titled uh, The City of Maritime Glory, contains mention of 2,000 enemies killed by her. In addition, the publications on famous Soviet female soldiers in the periodicals appeared because of their death. Uh, next slide, please. In particular, when it became known about the death of the famous pilot Marina Raskova on the 9th of January 1943, several Soviet newspapers published an article entitled In Memory of the Hero of the Soviet Union, Marina Raskova, written by her brothers and sisters in arms. Its text focused on the fact that she was a brave pilot, the heroine of a long distance flights, and the mentor of Soviet pilots. At the same time, it emphasizes the modesty of the heroine and the fact that Marina Raskova believed that Soviet aviation was created and existed to protect the peace. As noted above, the tradition of uh, publishing most of the materials devoted to female soldiers and to women's participation in the war in general on the eve of the International Women's Day on the 8th of March, which began in 1942, was kept in the following years. 
For example, in 1943, several materials were published before and after that date. The issue of women's service in the Soviet armed forces during the war is covered in the appeal of women from Moscow to Joseph Stalin, published in the Vichernia Moskva newspaper on the 10th of March 1943. On the eve of the holiday, they reported to the leader of the people about the contribution of Soviet women in the fight against the enemy, and emphasized that when the enemy went to Moscow, women defended the city together with men. They went to the anti-aircraft gun sites, became firefighters, etc. In addition, thousands of women from Moscow joined the ranks of the Red Army. They serve as snipers and machine gunners, signals officers and bombers, nurses and partisans. Several examples of the exploits of some of these women, in particular Zoya Kosmodemianska, Evgenia Poltavska and Alexandra lukovina Trubkova, Natalia Kavshova, Maria Polivanova, are given. Often paying some tribute to women who fought on the fronts, the authors of the newspaper articles focused only on a few traits of their service, ignoring the fact that they fought in almost all types of troops. For example, the article Women of the Great Nation, published on the eve of the 8th of March 1943 in the newspaper Soviet Siberia, mentioned only the large presence of women in the positions of signals officers, nurses, and health education supervisors. Next slide, please. The Soviet media periodically published photos of the service women. For example, in the newspaper Vichernia Moskva, a photo of two smiling female snipers was published on the 7th of September 1943. The text that accompanied it reported that it was Corporals Raisa Slipnikova and Olga Bykova who returned from the stakeout. They are happy and satisfied. Today, each of them killed two Nazis. In 1944, there was a significant decrease in the number of materials on women's service in the Red Army compared with the previous year. Since in 1944 the advantage in the war was clearly on the side of the Allied powers, the Soviet government did not need to recruit more women to the armed forces. Therefore, such a sharp decline in the numbers of materials about them in the periodicals may be due to this fact. This year, several materials about the female soldier, soldiers appeared on the eve of the 8th of March. For example, the authors of the article Heroic Daughters of the Soviet Land gave a separate paragraph about the female soldiers and uh, stated the following. Many brave female patriots came under the banner of the, of the our armed forces, became snipers, signals officers, anti-aircraft crew members, pilots, medical workers of the regular army. The feats of the heroes of the Soviet Union, Natalia Kavshova and Maria Polivanova, went down in the history of the war, and 75 girl snipers of the First Baltic Front, who continue their work, killed two and a half thousand Nazis in three months. People's memory will preserve for posterity the bright image of a young pilot, Lieutenant Lilia Lipiak, who shot down 12 German planes and died bravely in an unequal air battle. The Soviet people proudly heard in one of the orders of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief the name of Major Yevdokiya Bershanskaya, the commander of the Night Light Bomber Regiment that stood out during the destruction of the German bridgehead in the Kuban and is now called Tamansky. Even those materials that did not ignore the presence of women in the armed forces often interpreted it according to the usual set of stereotypes about the male and female gender roles. For example, the article by the heroine of the Soviet Union, sniper Lyudmila Pavlichenko, devoted to women at the front and in the rear, highlighted the fact of their presence in the Soviet armed forces in combat positions. It gave examples of heroism together with rhetoric about a caring woman's hand that defends her cities, takes care of male soldiers, restores cities destroyed by the enemy, zealously works in factories in male positions, etc. In this text, Lyudmila Pavlichenko called on women to work even harder for the needs of the front, as decisive victorious battles require resources. 
In general, compared to 1943, the periodicals increased mentions of female snipers and pilots. The article Girls Snipers, published on the 6th of June 1944 in the newspaper Krasnaya Zvezda, first focuses on the combat experience of sniper Rosa Shanina. However, it mentioned her sisters in arms. According to the author of the article, Major Miletsky, all these women are respected in their unit. Next slide, please. The note, Glorious Female Patriots, published on the 23rd of June 1944 in the newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda, is also dedicated to women snipers. A photo showing nine service women in uniform accompanies it. The text of the note states that a meeting of the snipers of the one of Red Army units was held. In a short period, the snipers girls of the unit killed 427 Germans. In 1945, the tendency to reduce the number of materials devoted to women in the war, both those covered their service and work in the rear, and those that told about the atrocities of the enemy over them, intensified. This was due to the significant advantage of the Allied powers over the enemy forces and the clear awareness of the imminent end of the war in their favor. There was no longer a need to agitate the population to join the armed forces, partisan detachments, go to work in military factories, etc. At the same time, materials about women in the war, including their military service, have not completely disappeared. Next slide, please. The number of articles on women continued to be disproportionately large in the first half of March on the eve of International Women's Day. Thus, in the newspaper Stalinsky Sokol, issued on the 7th of March 1945, one of the pages is completely devoted to the glorification of women. It contains several articles as well as portraits of six heroes of the Soviet Union, Meklin, Hasheva, Popova, Zhivulenko, Sibrova, and Ryabova. The article Soviet Female Patriots was primarily about the work of women in collective farms, factories, and other activities in the rear. Only the second part of the article stated that women also fought on the fronts of the Second World War. However, there are many questions regarding this description. First, it is presented after quoting Stalin's phrase, in the name of honor and independence of the motherland, Soviet women and youth show valor and heroism on the labor front. They proved worthy of their fathers and sons, husbands and brothers, who defended the motherland from Nazi inhumans. It means that as soon as the readers have formed in their minds a picture where men are fighting at the front and women are fighting in the rear, they are confronted with the fact that some other women fought together with the men. In addition, the article again uses a strange wording widespread in the first years of the war that women fight side by side with the Red Army soldiers on the fronts of the patriotic war. It turns out that the authors of this article did not address female soldiers as a part of the Red Army. Also, it was incorrect. To sum up, the materials of the Soviet newspapers are an important source for studying the policy of the totalitarian regime regarding the service of women in the armed forces of the USSR and its propaganda concerning that. Based on the frequency of materials, the dates of their publication and the content, it is possible to make assumptions about the needs of the Soviet armed forces and women personnel during a particular period of war as well as to evaluate the government's propaganda concerning female soldiers in general. However, the thematic articles contained almost no specific about the service of women in the armed forces of the USSR as a mass phenomenon. They did not provide data on the establishment of women's military units, general statistics on the presence of women in the army, conscription data, and more. The totalitarian regime kept this information secret. Sometimes, when it leaked to foreign media, the government tried to refute it. The only specifics that periodically occurred in Soviet periodicals were information about some heroines of the front. 
However, using the data about them, one needs to be careful because even here the relevant information is not always provided. For example, it is not clear how many enemies were killed by Nina Anilova, 500, 2000, as the newspapers wrote, or another number. As in many materials published in the Soviet periodicals during the war, there was either no place for female combatants at all, or they were mentioned briefly. In the materials concerning women's support in the war, their activities in the rear were emphasized first. At the same time, most cases addressing women in the periodicals were dedicated to the description of them as a vulnerable category of the population and victims. Even so, the Soviet Union recruited them into the army on an unprecedented scale and did not forbid them to participate in hostilities in, cost, in contrast to other countries, for example, Great Britain and the United States. At the beginning of the war, in 1941, the uh, Soviet newspapers often emphasized that there is no need for women soldiers in the army, as the country seemed to have enough male human resources. At the same time, the government created women's military air regiments. Most of the materials about women at the front in the Soviet periodicals dates back to 1942-1943, when the army was in dire need of female resources and authorities were trying to prompt the female population to join military ranks. Since 1944, when the Allied powers gained the upper hand in the war, the amount of materials about service women has declined significantly. Most of them in this and the following years were published on the eve of International Women's Day. The number of mentions of Soviet service women in the, and the peculiarities of coverage of their contribution to the war effort in the media testifies in favor of the fact that the Soviet government practiced a purely utilitarian approach to the female population. Also, in the war, interwar period, it was often claimed uh, gender equality. During the war, it changed tactics and focused on recreating traditional gender roles, where women are primarily victims of the enemy and workers of the rear. After all, such an approach made it possible to arouse popular anger against the background of atrocities committed by enemies in the Soviet territories to encourage men to fight harder against the enemy and women to work in industry and agriculture. The admission of Soviet women to military roles in the war was the result of the catastrophic losses of the USSR's army in the early days of the war, rather than the desire to establish gender equality in society. Consequently, female veterans of the Soviet-German war became a marginal group in the post-war period. Next slide please. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so Thank much, you Natalia, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we are going to go right into the question and answer period. So um, if you have questions, any of the people listening, if you have questions, I can't talk today. Uh, please feel free to type them in the comment section on YouTube and we will get to them. Uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting on them, I had a few questions. Uh, so I do know that you 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 studied these periodicals. What I'm uh, what I wonder is what happened, were there mentions of these women after the war uh, was over and what happened to them and how they were honored and treated? Меня очень интересует вопрос, как об этих женщинах и насколько часто упоминали в периодических изданиях после войны, и как именно, что о них говорили, и остались ли они живы, вообще были ли упоминания какие-нибудь? Ну, на самом деле, этот вопрос э, я не исследовала, то есть я, мое задание было исследовать только э, упоминания о женщинах в период советско-германской войны, и, соответственно, я не могу точно сказать, сколько было упоминаний этих женщин и именно в каком контексте. Я знаю только, что есть исследования, которые касаются женщин-ветеранок Великой Отечественной войны, 
или Второй мировой войны, которые говорят о том, что фактически ветеранки после военный период были вычеркнуты из общественной жизни, из публичного пространства, потому что после военный период их обвиняли в легком поведении, в том, что они украли мужей у жен, которые ждали их в тылу. То есть фактически общество воспринимала этих женщин как исключительно вот такой феномен походно-полевых жен и какого своего рода конкуренток. И фактически в публичном пространстве ветеранки начали появляться только в режим во время правления Брежнева. Их начали опять упоминать, и об этом, кстати, упоминает также Светлана Алексеевич и ее респондент, которые также были ветеранками Второй мировой войны и также говорили о том, что жаловались, что их начали приглашать на даты commemoration, yes. даты, которые, в общем, то есть фактически, да, на важные даты, которые, ну, то есть на 9 мая, да, на День Победы, который вот в Советском Союзе был принят как День Победы, фактически ветеранок начали приглашать только где-то вот в 70-х годах. Вот, и, ну, то есть вот как-то так. Okay. So, personally, I must say that I haven't studied this issue. That was not the point of my research. Uh, my point was actually to study uh, how much they were mentioned and in what context during the Soviet-German war. But I can say that uh, there are some research on um, how often they were mentioned and what their life was like after uh, the Second World War as of veterans. And uh, according to this research, after war, they were almost taken out of the uh, mentionings of all the life which was going on. They were completely forgotten because there was some kind of um, uh, atmosphere around them. They were treated mostly like uh, prostitutes. Uh, who were stealing uh, wives, uh, uh, sorry, were stealing husbands uh, or who were fighting on the front, like fighting uh, next to them. And there is even a special um, nickname uh, for them, which appeared during that period. They were like field wives, they were called. And uh, this um, atmosphere, this um, Uh, treatment to them uh, was was kept uh, till the times of uh, Brezhnev. So only during his ruling uh, they started to reappear uh, in, in the life of the country and they started to invite them for different uh, commemoration dates, uh, namely for the Victory Day, And uh, uh, as a lot of them were uh, complaining that they were like forgotten and treated uh, in their own way. So mostly they reappeared in the life of the Soviet Union in the 70s of the previous century. That's it. Well, thank you. That, that does answer the question. Wow. I'm... So the idea that their narrative was completely changed after the war. It, it's not surprising, but it, it, it's sort of sad. Um, my next question, in the mentions, was there a, sh well, you kind of talked about it, but a little bit more of like the shift from the beginning of the war, like when, uh, when they were saying there was no need for women to be, um, be in the Red Army when they started serving to, you know, when they started, you know, becoming these great pilots and things like that. The mentions in the newspapers are, do they, how do they change? 
you know, how do they they start talking about the women, you know, from the beginning to to the end? How does the narrative shift? Вы, конечно, уже говорили немного об этом, но интересно именно, как произошел вот этот сдвиг в информации, которая появлялась в газетах, с того, что сначала о них говорили, что нет необходимости женщинам воевать в рядах советской армии, до того, как их все-таки начали называть великими пилотами и отдавать им вот как бы такую дань да, за то, что они вносили свой вклад. Как именно происходило это изменение? Спасибо за вопрос. Дело в том, что это изменение на самом деле не было настолько очевидным. И на самом деле фактически за весь период войны большинство статей, которые посвящали женщинам, они касались не женщин, которые воевали на фронте. Это, опять же таки, были женщины как жертвы нацистов. И такие материалы обычно использовались для поднятия патриотизма, да, боевого духа у населения и у советской армии, для того, чтобы, скажем, лучше проявить себя на поле боя. Вот. А те материалы, которые начали появляться уже где-то после 1942 года, скажем, когда упоминания о женщинах стали более частыми, они обычно касались каких-то конкретных фигур, то есть вот, ну, буквально несколько десятков женщин, которые проявили себя, ну, сделали какие-то героические поступки а, на фронте, и вот о них действительно выходили материалы в газетах. А, и это скорее... То есть в таких материалах, несмотря на то, что фактически в советской армии служило около одного миллиона женщин, не было нигде упоминаний о масштабах этого явления, о масштабах присутствия женщин в армии. То есть даже вот там... В 1942-1943 году. Вот в 1942 году, например, было не меньше четырех волн мобилизации женщин. То есть это уже были не женщины, которые добровольно присоединились к армии, а именно это были мобилизации. И в том числе и в подразделения, которые отправляли на фронт, не только тыловые. Но дело в том, что фактически советская власть пыталась представить женщин, вот, о которых были упоминания в газетах, как такие себе э, исключения из правил. Да? То есть вот есть какие-то э, примеры э, особого героизма отдельных женщин, но это не значит, что все женщины идут на фронт, не значит, что это массовое явление, э, и что, в принципе, как бы э, большая, больше, очень большое количество женщин присутствует в Красной Армии. То есть, как такового вот этого сдвига, его, возможно, даже и не было, потому что те упоминания, о которых я говорила, они фактически были очень скудными, и они появлялись обычно в материалах, которые были посвящены Международному женскому дню. Вот даже если посмотреть лозунги ЦК ВКПБ, да, то а, только в документах, которые были вот, приурочены к 8 марта, упоминались вообще женщины на фронте. Если смотреть на лозунги, которые были, например, выпускались к годовщинам советской армии или к Дню труда, то а, вообще солдаты разных родов войск к ним обращались исключительно маскулинитивах, да, к мужском роде. А, причем в женском роде обращались там, ну, скажем, к гражданским специальностям, там, например, колхозницы, работницы, то есть работники и работницы. Да, вот. А то, что касалось солдат, то, собственно, там не было упоминания о женщин. По сути, такие, скажем, очень нечастые упоминания о том, что все-таки женщин в советской армии немножко больше, чем там несколько снайперов и несколько э, пилотов, да, э, они начались где-то вот в 1942-1943 году. Э, и, конечно, почему, ну, почему они начали появляться? Потому что в эти годы 
было произведено самое большое количество мобилизаций. И именно в эти годы, когда советская армия понесла катастрофические утраты в ходе боевых действий, у них возросли, соответственно, потребности в живой силе, и они начали призывать женщин. Но, опять же таки, подчеркиваю, что вот меня лично в этом исследовании, когда я его проводила, поразило то, что фактически советская власть очень мало приделяла внимание в публичном дискурсе, в частности, в газетных статьях, потому что, как мы знаем, советские газеты, они были полностью под властью правительства, они очень мало времени уделяли именно вот вопросу о масштабах женской службы и вообще принципе, пытались, ее, пытались эти масштабы скрыть. Okay, so actually talking about the shift, I must say that it was not really obvious, because most articles that, uh, that were published, they were not about women. Women were mentioned mostly as victims of Nazis, and it was done with the purpose of raising spirits of Soviet soldiers, make them fight like more fiercely at the front. So the mat, uh, it changed a bit after 1942. Uh, women were mentioned <clears throat> a bit more often, but still only some specific figures were mentioned. And uh, for example, like uh, one his, uh, heroic deed or another heroic deed, and uh, the, uh, the newspapers never mentioned that there was about one million women who were fighting uh, at the front as, as soldiers. And they never mentioned the scale of mobilization of women, which actually started in 1942, when not less than four waves of mobilization of women happened. And <clears throat> they were really sent to the front to fight, not only to the rear, as uh, <clears throat> were employed yeah, for military uh, specialities. Uh, and we... Uh, Uh, Soviet government showed them just those who were mentioned in the newspapers were mentioned rather as exceptions, not as the uh, regular um, fighters, regular soldiers, uh, not in mass. Uh, like to show that there are not a lot of them in the Soviet army. So we can say that there were no uh, shift uh, as such in mentioning. And those, uh, which, uh, those articles which we can find, they were really very scarce. And they were mostly dedicated to the Women's Day on the 8th of March. Uh, if we look at the slogans uh, in the newspapers, so uh, then the slogans dedicated to the 8th of March will mention women while slogans dedicated to other holidays will mention mostly male soldiers. And if you see at the masculine and feminine mentionings, uh, the soldiers, they will be actually masculines mostly, like males. And civil jobs, uh, like uh, workers of the collective farm, they were mostly mentioned as women. Uh, so, uh, Uh, not a lot of mention, uh, mentioning was about women snipers. Uh, rather, I would say that in 1942-43, uh, there was uh, some shift because uh, then mobilization was at its high, uh, as the Soviet army had really big losses at the front. And then there was a need for women to substitute those soldiers who were dying. Uh, when I was doing my research, I was really surprised that uh, it, it, it was not a surprise actually for me that Soviet government uh, and the newspapers did not write about the scale of mobilization of women and the scale of their participation in the, uh, in the front as real soldiers. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, We don't have any comment or comments or questions in the chat. And that was my last question. So we are going to uh, take a short break um, and then come back for our Scholar Spotlight. So again, thank you, Natalia, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you to our audience for listening. Um, 
if you can't, if you are unable to stay with us for the Scholar Spotlight, uh, today was our last day. Uh, so we don't have any more programs after this, but you can always come back to uh, YouTube if you'd like to watch them and rewatch them or share them. Uh, but hopefully you will be able to stay with us and we will be right back in about five minutes.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome back, Natalia. Uh, I do want to recognize Tatiana, who is our translator. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Uh, so we are uh, going right into our scholar spotlight, and this is where we'll learn a little bit more about you, Natalia, and a little bit more about your research. All right. So our first question is, tell me what drew you to your topic. Как вы и почему вы начали заниматься этой темой? Okay, I, I will try to uh, explain in English. So at school we had a museum dedicated to the Second World War. I worked there and conducted excursions for pupils from the 6th to 10th grades as well as for school visitors. Uh, there I understood that I want to be a historian and study the Second World War in the future. And in 2007, I en enrolled at the Historical Institute of the National Pedagogical Dragomanov University and received my master's degree in 2012. And I became interested in studying women's and gender history during my study at the university. I decided to continue my study as a PhD student at the World History Department of the same university. And uh, my supervisor, suggested the topic of my PhD research on women in the social and political life of Great Britain from the last third of the 19th century to 1939. And I agreed to study it because it was a new issue for Ukrainian scholarship in those days. Uh, women's history actually was not very popular here 10 years ago, and there was a lack of information on women's movement in our university courses, for example. So I wrote my dissertation and defended it in 2016. But at the same time, I was interested in studying the Second World War in the gender context. And just after finishing my PhD dissertation, I decided to conduct another study planned on my own, and it is on the policy of the governments of Great Britain and the USSR on the women's service in the armed forces during the Second World War. The study that I presented here today is just one aspect of it. I decided to study the policy of the Soviet and British authorities on women's military service because uh, these countries recruited a large scale of female population during this war. But the studies on the issue showed that uh, there was no gender equality in the military of both countries, and the attitude towards female veterans was rather negative in the post-war -year years. Um, and even nowadays, British Army had some problems with gender equality, as well as the countries of the post-Soviet space, and uh, the possibility of women's participation in combat still causes concerns. Uh, in the context of studying Soviet newspapers, I had two goals. Uh, first, to find out its significance for the study of women's service, because Soviet newspapers were under the pressure of authorities and couldn't share relevant information. And the second is to highlight public discourse on service women during the war. Okay, thank you. Uh, so in that kind of same vein, can you tell us a little bit about your methods, your research methods um, or and or your process? So yes, uh, for this study, I used a critical discourse analysis. It's a research enterprise which critically analyzes the relations between language and society. Uh, more specifically, this critical discourse analysis is a type of discourse analytical research that studies the way ideology, identity, and inequality are reenacted through texts produced in social and political contexts. I choose the newspapers of the war years and analyze their content on women in general. Thanks to digitalization, now by searching by keywords, it is possible to discover some specific trends uh, based on the frequency of mentioning some particular issues. In that way, I found out how many times 
women were mentioned in the context of victims, labor workers, partisans, doctors, and soldiers during the war. Of course, I was really surprised by the frequency of mentioning women as the most vulnerable category of society, um, mostly because in the Soviet Union, women usually were rather strong even if they didn't serve in the Red Army. Working on the land, in factories and so on you know, requires good physical and mental health too. And the way of describing of women on military service had its own specifics too, and I have already shown that today. Okay, and that sort of leads us into our next question. You sort of answered it, but I do want to give you a little space to expound if you'd like. Uh, and that is what surprised you the most about this topic. Oh, I think, of course, it's the fact that the Soviet authorities tried to hide and to omit mentioning of women's presence in the army, despite their large scale involvement. It really did not correspond to their rhetoric before the war about gender equality. And I have never thought that it is really possible to present approximately one million of service women in the army as one big exception to the rule. So, yes, I, I, I was surprised. Uh, of course, I know that the kind of Soviet regime, but uh, at the same time, I was still surprised. The, and in your research, did you get to a, 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 an actual, you know, solid why they were doing it, they tried to do that? Uh, I think uh, if they wanted uh, to keep gender roles uh, traditional, yes, because um, during the war, uh, the majority of Red Army was male. And they wanted... Um, to inspire men to fight uh, more actively by um, specific public discourse. And they used women and their image in society for this purpose too. And uh, I think this uh, policy, it was rather effective, but of course, uh, women uh, became victims of this regime and uh, female veterans instead of uh, i don't know of commemoration and uh, uh, people's uh, uh, sen sen thankful <laughs> people should be thankful to them but they were not and uh, um, female veterans became just a marginal group uh, as a consequence of this policy um, let's see, uh, what, what did you find to be your biggest challenge when studying and researching this topic? I think um, in studying Soviet newspapers, the biggest challenge was to analyze lots of the issues because many of these newspapers were published daily and included a lot of information. Of course, the Soviet public discourse was rather aggressive and primitive and included lots of repetitions. So it was really hard to read and realize that people lived under this regime for many years. In the context of comparative study that I mentioned, um, it was very challenging to make such a comparison of many difficult aspects of the problem um, and to process a lot of primary sources for both countries. And of course, it was very hard to understand um, that those women who uh, had patriotic position, they were um, not um, um, их не отблагодарили в той степени, в которой они этого заслуживали. They were not appreciated as much as they deserved. All right. Um, so my last question is, uh, what are your future plans and goals? What's next for you? Yes. It's an interesting question because uh, it's connected with uh, 
a complicated system of our uh, academic degrees. So I'm finalizing my monograph on British and Soviet politics toward service women during the Second World War. And I hope I will be able to publish it very soon. And in Ukraine, we have two academic degrees. I have already obtained a PhD in history, and I want to obtain a degree of doctor in history. And uh, I need this monograph for this purpose too. In some countries, there is a doctor habilitat, which is similar to our second doctor's degree, but not completely the same. Um, in Ukraine, the second doctor's degree is not strongly connected to the universities and some positions at these universities, in contrast to Dr. Habilita, which is uh, widespread in Western Union, uh, Europe. Uh, we have the opportunity to gain uh, doctors, the second doctor's degree uh, while working at the universities or at the research institutions, and somebody can hold the position of, of professor at the university without that degree. But those who held this degree are considered as more skilled professionals. Uh, so yes, to obtain a second doctor, doctor's degree, one should publish not less than 20 articles, publish a, mon publish a monograph and defend it. It's very similar to PhD defense. Uh, after that, once uh, one receives a second doctor's degree diploma. So yes, it's my next goal. Wow, and how, how long will that take? Or about how long? Oh, I think um, it took me six years to, to write uh, my monograph, yes. And I am still finalizing it. I hope that this year uh, it will be done. And so I don't know, maybe the end of this year and, or the beginning of the next year, I will have the defense of this um, second dissertation and uh, receive my diploma of doctor in history. Wow. It's my thanks. Well, good luck on that. <laughs> um, I, I think you'll, you'll do wonderful, but, but good luck. Uh, so I want to say thank you again Natalia, for your, your wonderful presentation. I want to say thank you to everyone who has tuned in for uh, each day of our symposium, but also especially for today, our last day. Um, we are very, very proud of this symposium and uh, hope to continue it. So we'll see you again next year. Have a great day. Thanks.